Brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 16. We're going to begin in 1 Kings chapter 16. Of course, this is about the demise of Ahab and Jezebel. And here at the end of 1 Kings chapter 16, from verse 29, we're introduced to King Ahab. Now, you may have heard Bill and Hillary Clinton referred to as Ahab and Jezebel. Quite rightly so. <laughs> when you study the books of Kings and Chronicles, it's important to note that there is the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. After the time of Solomon, the kingdom split into the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. So you have a northern king and a southern king. And it can get quite confusing throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles which kingdom you're in. So in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29, we're introduced to the king of the northern kingdom, King Ahab, who was eventually the most wicked king that Israel had ever seen at the time. So 1 Kings chapter 16 from verse 29, are we all there? 1 Kings 16, 29, in the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, that's the southern kingdom of course, Ahab the son of Omri became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Onri, reigned over Israel in Samaria, 22 years. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, and of course Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. Reigned over Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So what it's saying is, is that the sins that he walked in, according to Jeroboam, who was the first king of the northern kingdom, this was nothing in comparison to marrying this wicked woman Jezebel, Sardinian. So basically she was a Phoenician, which is now um, north of Israel, what we call Lebanon. She was from the kingdom of Phoenicia. And of course, the gods that they worship was Baal. Baal was a Canaanite god, and this is now the god that she has introduced into Israel. So they are now turning their backs on the one true god, and they're worshipping a false god, Baal. It was Jezebel who introduced idolatry into the kingdom of Israel. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, there's seven letters in Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, seven letters to seven churches, and soon we are going to be speaking about the church of Laodicea. So I'll be talking more about this then. But basically, these seven churches, they were seven literal churches which existed in the first century. However, scholars are unanimous that these seven churches represent seven stages throughout church history. And one of the letters here to Thyatira kind of corresponds to that, the, the era of the Catholic Church, which of course was the church who introduced idolatry into the church. And of course, this is why Jesus refers to Jezebel here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, of course, we know that Jezebel is an idiom for false religion. No doubt there was a literal woman called Jezebel who existed in the first century in this church in Thyatira. However, we have to understand these things in a Hebrew mindset, in that Jezebel is an idiom for idolatry and false religion. So when he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, he's talking about tolerating idolatry and false religion. The Catholic Church introduced idolatry and worshipping idols into the church and it was of course Jezebel who introduced idolatry into the kingdom of Israel by worshipping this false god Baal. Notice it says you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now people say that we have to be tolerant, people say we have to be accepting. Well Jesus here is saying no, you're not supposed to tolerate idolatry, you're not supposed to tolerate this woman Jezebel. When you see any wicked, immoral woman in the Bible, it's an idiom for false religion and idolatry and spiritual deception. I spoke about this 
Some time ago, when I did a commentary on Proverbs chapter 7, the wicked immoral woman represents idolatry and false religion. And of course, it all foreshadows the last one. It all foreshadows the final one, Babylon the Great, the great whore of Babylon in Revelation 18. This is what it all foreshadows. So moving on, in 1 Kings 17, we're introduced to Elijah, the prophet Elijah, who was the only prophet left at the time who was uh, not going astray. And of course, because of the idolatry of the Israelites, Elijah pronounced that there'd be a drought. It will not rain now at, until, until my word. So because of the Israelites' idolatry, Elijah has pronounced a drought in Israel, no more rain. And now God tells Elijah to leave the land of Israel and to go to the other side of the Jordan River. That's when God sent the ravens to feed him. He sent ravens to feed Elijah, and Elijah drank from the brook in Cherith. Now, of course, he's keeping, Israel, he's keeping Elijah out of Israel now. He's basically withdrawing grace from Israel. That's what he's going to do to us in the last days. He's going to withdraw the prophets. He's going to withdraw the evangelists and the preachers as a way of closing the ark door. So basically now, Elijah has been kept out of Israel. The rest of chapter 17, Elijah is sent to Zarephath in Sidon, incidentally where Jezebel was from. A widow and her son. And this is, of course, where we see the miracle of the oil and the flour. Elijah is a major type of Christ in that his miracles foreshadow the miracles of Jesus. That miracle with the oil and the flour, he made the oil and the flour last, and also he raised the widow's son from the dead. These are all miracles which foreshadow the Messiah. Jesus refers to this story in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was reading from the uh, scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue in Nazareth. He makes reference here to this story of uh, Elijah raising the widow's son from the dead. And then in chapter 18, Elijah is then sent back to Israel to confront Ahab and confront Ahab about his idolatry and worshipping other gods. During which time, Jezebel had already executed all the prophets of the Lord. All the prophets of the Lord had been executed by Jezebel, except for those 100 prophets who Obadiah had hidden. His servant Obadiah had hidden 100 prophets. So if we go to 1 Kings 18, verse 17, 1 Kings 18, verse 17, Elijah has now returned and goes to confront Ahab. 1 Kings 18, verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now, how many times do we get called troublemakers when we're out preaching the truth? Why is Elijah being called a troubler of Israel? Because he's the only one been preaching the truth for the last three and a half years. That's exactly what we get. We go out and preach the truth, and we get called troublers, don't we? Well, you're in the character of Elijah. You're in good company if that's you. Troubler of Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Now this expression, eating at Jezebel's table, of course what it means is partaking in the same sins of Jezebel. We hear this term Jezebel thrown around quite a lot, oh she's got a spirit of Jezebel. That's not actually a biblical term. The meaning of Jezebel in the Bible is of course idolatry, that's what Jezebel means. So to eat at Jezebel's table is to partake in the same sins as her, idolatry. When people are worshipping idols and worshipping other gods, they are eating at Jezebel's table. Now, do you have to be bowing down to statues and praying to other gods to be committing idolatry? No, you don't. Anything in your life which you're prioritising before God, anything in your life which you have more love for than God, is an idol. Anything which you prioritise over the Lord is an idol. And that's why, whenever you have anything which is, which is prioritising God in your life, whether it's sport, whether it's music, whether it's money, whether it's your family or children, you're eating at Jezebel's table. You're committing idolatry. So that's what it means to eat at Jezebel's table. You, you can't eat at Jezebel's table and eat at the table of the Lord at the same time. You can't drink from the cup of the Lord and drink from the cup of demons, 1 Corinthians 10. You can either eat at Jezebel's table or you can come to the Lord's table. You can't come to both. So in 1 Kings 18 here, Elijah has basically set a challenge, a challenge at Mount Carmel. The 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, another false god. And basically, they're going to make a sacrifice upon the altar. 
You summon your God Baal, and if he appears in fire, then he is the one true Lord, and then I'll pray to my God, and if my God appears in fire, he is the one true God. It's basically a, like a, a challenge. So basically, the prophets of Baal, they try, they try and summon Baal to come down to set fire to the altar. Nothing happens. Notice in verse 28, it says, So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. It's exactly what Muslims do, isn't it? They have what's known as the festival of Muharram, which commemorates the martyrdom of Muhammad's grandson. And what do they do? They cut themselves. Have you ever seen the videos on Facebook of Muslims basically slashing themselves to pieces? That's where it comes from. It comes from paganism. It comes from these idol worshippers. So then Elijah prepares an altar and a sacrifice. And then he prays, summons the Lord God, and the Lord God appears in fire and consumes the sacrifice, doesn't he? So then the people now have seen who is the one true God, and that Baal is nothing but a false idol. And this is when the Israelites once again be begin worshipping the one true God. And in the meantime, Elijah has executed all these prophets of Baal. And of course, after that, the drought was over. It was then when the Lord sent rain once again, once the people had turned back to God. And of course, we see that that time, according to James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, and also according to Luke 4.25, the amount of time that that drought lasted for was three and a half years. Three and a half years should mean a lot to you. It basically is the time of the tribulation in the last days, isn't it? Three and a half years is always very significant. So for three and a half years, there was no rain. What is water and rain a type of in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. For three and a half years there is going to be no Holy Spirit during the tribulation. The Holy Spirit is going to be withdrawn according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is going to get taken. Just like it came at Acts chapter 2, that's going to get reversed. The Holy Spirit is going to be taken, there'll be no more preaching of the gospel, and there'll be no more conviction of sin. That is God saying it's game over. So that is a foreshadowing there of what's going to happen in the last days. No rain for three and a half years. And in chapter 19, this is when Ahab basically tells Jezebel what took place, that Elijah had executed the prophets of Baal, just as she executed the prophets of the Lord. And this is when Elijah flees to the cave in the wilderness, isn't it? God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? Verse 10, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life. So notice that Elijah was very jealous for the Lord. I explained last week at the book of Nahum what jealousy actually means biblically, and Elijah was jealous for the Lord. So because Elijah had a strong, healthy, intimate relationship with the Lord, whatever angers the Lord is going to anger Elijah. Just like Phineas, Phineas, the one who put that javelin through the two idolaters in the tent, it was because he was jealous for the Lord. And it was actually that that stilled the plague, wasn't it? Back in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. So basically, if you have a strong, healthy relationship with the Lord, whatever angers the Lord is going to anger you. Righteous anger. I'm talking about righteous anger here. Just like Jesus, when he rode into the temple and drove out the uh, money changers because he was enraged because of the, of the idolatry that was going on. Whatever angers God is going gonna, is gonna to anger you. Whatever God loves, you're going to love. The world loves the things that God hates and hates the things that God loves. But if it's the other way around, then you should examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Verse 15, chapter 19, verse 15. Go, return your, on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahalah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So here, this is God lining up what's going to be the next leaders. We're going to have a new king over Syria, a new king over the kingdom of Israel, who is this Jehu, who we're introduced to. And of course, Elisha, do not confuse Elijah and Elisha. Elisha will be Elijah's successor. But he's going to be his assistant in the meantime. And this is when... God says to Elijah, I have, rever I have reserved 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 11 to talk about the remnant, the remnant of Israel, the faithful remnant of Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And that is basically us, brothers and sisters. The church right now, they're bowing their knee to Baal, aren't they? They're bowing their knee to the system. They're bowing their knee to the beast. 
And we, brothers and sisters, are that faithful remnant who are not going to bow, as we said many weeks ago. We will not bow. Daniel chapter 3. 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. So the rest of chapter 19, this is now where we're introduced to this Elisha, who's basically going to be Elijah's servant and his eventual successor. In chapter 20, this is where the war goes against the Assyrians. Sorry, the Syrians, not the Assyrians. They are actually two different people. The Syrians and the Israelites defeat the Syrians, but Ahab is condemned because he's made a, uh, an ungodly treaty with Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. This is when we go into chapter 21. This is where we see the pinnacle of Ahab's wickedness and ultimately Jezebel's wickedness. Chapter 21, from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was, ne- which was in Jezreel. Jezreel was, of course, in the north of Israel. A vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house. And for it, I'll give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seem good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. So he's saying, Give me your vineyard, I'll give you a better vineyard than its place, or I'll just buy it off you. Now, we need to understand what the vineyard means in the Bible. Turn now to Isaiah chapter 5, but keep your thumb on 1 Kings 21. We'll be going back to that. Keep your thumb on 1 Kings 21 and go to Isaiah chapter 5. Again, we must understand the Hebrew typology in all of these stories. And we're going to see that the vineyard, biblically, represents Israel. When you see a vineyard in the Bible, it's talking about Israel, as we're going to see in Isaiah chapter 5 from verse 1. Is everyone there? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now let me sing to my well, uh, let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a winepress in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge pleased between me and my vineyard. What more could could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. What does it say in Job, in the chapter 1? What is the hedge? It's the hedge of protection, isn't it? The hedge of protection that was around Job. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burnt, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up breeders and thorns. What do thorns mean in the Bible? It's the curse of sin, isn't it? What happened when Adam sinned? Thorns will now grow. Thorns, and what was Jesus wearing on his head? A crown of thorns, taking the curse of sin for us. Thorns have to do with sin and curse in the Bible. Shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that, that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. There we go. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So the vineyard there has to do with Israel. God planted this vineyard, just like he planted the nation in Israel, bringing them out of Egypt into the promised land. He wanted them to bring forth fruit. He expects us to bring forth fruit, but they brought forth wild grapes instead. In other words, they went astray, worshipping other gods. They abandoned the Lord to worship idols, didn't they? And this is what it means, that they did not produce the fruit that he was looking for. Now, of course... The Pharisees knew from the scriptures that the vineyard represents Israel because this is what we see Jesus talk about in Matthew 21. After Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey in Matthew 21, he then goes to tell a parable, doesn't he? The parable of the wicked tenants. And of course, he was telling the parable against the Pharisees and they knew that. And that's why they were very angry and went to stone him. Let's just, uh, I'm going to read to you Matthew 21 verses 33 to 46 very quickly. Here, another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. There's that hedge again, a hedge of protection that the Lord had over Israel. Set a hedge around it. Dug a wine press and built a tower and he leased it to the vine dressers. He's pretty, pretty much quoting Isaiah 5 there, word for word, isn't he, Jesus? 
and then he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, in other words, the time to start making wine, he sent his servants to the vine dressers. The servants there represent the prophets. He sent his prophets. He sent his servants that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one and killed one and stoned another. They used to kill the prophets, didn't they? Isaiah was sawn in half. The prophets were murdered, weren't they? And again, he sent other servants, more than first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them. Who's that, of course? That is Jesus, isn't it? He sent his son to them. They said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. They nailed him to a cross, didn't they? And seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their season. In other words, the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles who will produce the fruit that God was looking for. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Quoting uh, Psalm 118 there. This was the Lord's doing, and is a marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruit. In other words, again, the gospel going to the Gentiles, taken away from Israel. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So in other words, the Pharisees knew, based on Isaiah chapter 5, that Jesus was telling this parable against them and saying, you are the wicked vine dressers who have killed the prophets and now you're going to kill God's only son. That's what he's basically saying here. So we've established very clearly that the vineyard in the Bible represents Israel. Whenever you see that, again, it's called expositional consistency. It always represents the same thing throughout scripture. Let's go back to 1 Kings 21, verse 3 we left off from. So the king is coveting Naboth's vineyard. Naboth said, no, I'm not going to, he's going to say now, I'm no, I'm not going to let my vineyard go. Verse 3, but Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would, not eat, and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money. Or else, if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Now this is where Jezebel is now going to begin to stir up Ahab and egg him on to commit this abominable act. Verse 7. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. In other words, she's saying, Are you the king of Israel or not? That's what she's saying. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders of the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honour among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels before him, to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. What she's saying there is they're going to set up Naboth with some lies. They're going to get some slander now going against Naboth, saying that he's blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him, that he may die. So the men of his city, the elders and nobles, who were inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had said to them. And it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honour among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, saying, Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, uh, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So basically they've had Naboth killed, murdered for lies, and she's now saying, now go and take possession of his vineyard. What a wicked act. 
So it was, verse 16, so it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead that Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. So it's a bit like when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband murdered on the front line. Same sort of thing, wicked, wicked, heinous act. And now the Lord is saying to one of the prophets, now go and speak to this man about his sin. Verse 19. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken possession? Exactly what David did. He murdered and took possession of his wife, Uriah's wife, didn't he? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. What you did is going to happen to you. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. So in other words, he's going to cut off the Ahab dynasty completely. He's going to completely cut off and execute the house of Ahab altogether. Not just him, but the whole family. And uh, verse 23, And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel his wife stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites had done, a pagan nation, Amorites, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So, what do we have here? We have a wicked king who's coveting the vineyard, Israel. A wicked king who's coveting the, vi the, the vineyard, and a wicked woman who has stirred up the king to go and take possession of the vineyard through lies and through murder. This is kind of replayed in the story of John the Baptist and Herodias. In Mark chapter 6, verse 14 to 29, what was John the Baptist doing? He was calling out Herod for his sin. Herod was married to his brother's wife. And John the Baptist used to call him out for his sin, didn't he? Just like Elijah was calling out Ahab for his sin. So then, on Herod's birthday, they say, what would you like? Sorry, to the daughter, what would you like? And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So then Herod didn't actually want to go ahead with this. Herod didn't actually want to execute John the Baptist. But it was the wicked woman, Herodias, who stirred him up. It was the wicked woman who persecuted the man of God. Just like Jezebel persecuted Elijah, just like Jezebel stirred up Ahab to go and murder Naboth, it was Herodias who stirred up the king and offered John the Baptist's head on a platter. So it's kind of replayed in that story. You have a wicked king and a wicked woman working in collaboration with each other. Now that's exactly what's going to happen in the last days. Remember, the wicked woman represents the false religious establishment. And of course the king represents the political establishment. So what's going to happen according to Revelation? The false prophet, the religious figure, is going to turn the political establishment against the people of God. Just like we saw here foreshadowed in 1 Kings 21. The wicked woman, the religious system, is going to turn the wicked king, the political system, against the people of God. That's what's going to happen in the last days. And we see that in Revelation chapter 13, where the false prophet orders the whole world to worship the beast and bow down and to receive the mark. We're seeing foreshadowings and precursors to this already, aren't we? Remember in Revelation 13, there are two beasts, one out of the earth and one out of the sea, one religious, one political. Now in verse 27, this is where we're going to see some repentance. Again, these sermons that we're doing in the last couple of weeks, they're repentance themed. We're going to see now Ahab does actually repent from verse 27. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put off sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. That's a repentance ritual that he's doing. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. 
because he, was hum because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house, upon his dynasty. He's going to bring the calamity now in the days of his son. Why? Because Ahab has repented. What, though, was the same kind of theme we spoke about last week? God has not removed the disaster, has he? The disaster and the cutting off of the dynasty is still coming, but Ahab's repentance has delayed it. Just like in the book of Nahum, we saw that Nineveh's repentance delayed the judgment, which Jonah pronounced against Nineveh, it delayed. And then in the book of Nahum, Nineveh was still destroyed 150 years later. So repentance, when you go that far, when you go that wicked, repentance will only buy you time. It will not buy you a way out. It will only buy time. When Israel went into idolatry and false gods, sacrificing their children to idols, God has said, you have now gone too far, the disaster will come. But because of Josiah's repentance, because of the repentance which took place under Josiah, the judgment was delayed. It wasn't stopped, it was delayed. And we see God work in this way all the time in the Bible. So Ahab's repentance delayed the disaster that was coming. Why? Because he went too far. He had gone beyond the point of no return. Verse 19, so we see one prophecy of the destruction of Ahab, the political figure. Thus says the Lord in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And then in verse 23, we see the prophecy of the destruction of Jezebel, the religious system, the false religious system. Verse 23, and concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Now this is when we go into chapter 22, and we're going to see how Ahab falls. What is the demise of Ahab now? Remember, he has repented, but he is still destined now for destruction. And we're going to see how the Lord does it. He does it in a very, um, let's say, unique way, which you won't see many, too many times in the Bible. Chapter 22, verse 1. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. So now we have a different king now reigning in the south, Jehoshaphat. And there's actually now peace between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. You can see more about Jehoshaphat's reign in 2 Chronicles chapters 17 to 20. It's because the book of Chronicles focuses more on the southern kingdom and the book of Kings focuses primarily on the northern kingdom. But you do see some crossovers sometimes. That's what we're seeing right here. Verse 3, And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me and fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? In other words, Jehoshaphat can tell that these prophets here are basically phonies. He knows they're not true prophets of the Lord. He's saying, Is there another prophet we can inquire of? Verse 7. Beg your pardon, verse 8. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imnah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. So basically, because Micaiah is always telling the truth, Ahab hates him. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the people... So all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chaniah, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. He's not prophesying by the Lord here, he's prophesying by his own imagination. Verse 12. And all the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger had gone to call Micaiah, spoke to him, saying, Now listen the words of the prophets with one accord. Encourage the king. So they're basically telling Micaiah what to say. When you give this word of prophecy, they're telling him what to say. May it be a word of encouragement. 
Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. So when people tell us what to say, we got told what to say a few weeks ago in town, didn't we? We said, no, we must say what the Lord has told us to say, not what you want to hear. Then he came to the king and said, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, there's going to be a tone of sarcasm there in that statement. He's speaking sarcastically there. Go and prosper, and he'll deliver it into your hand. Verse 16. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? He knows he's being sarcastic about it. Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered. He's going to speak the truth now. I saw Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would prophesy that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? He's saying, Yeah, I told you this guy hates me. He's only going to prophesy evil concerning me. Then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. When you hear a prophet say that, that means he's speaking from the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So you've got spirits here, before the throne of God, and he's saying, Who wants to go up and entice Ahab into a battle he's going to die in? Very, very... You know, people have a problem with this idea of God destroying people in this way. So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in this manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him. Also prevail, go out and do so. So there's a spirit here. It's a bit like in the book of Job, where the spirits present themselves before God. There's a lying spirit here who said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of those prophets. Micaiah here is recounting what he saw. So what he's saying is is that those prophets are being influenced by a lying spirit. Now these terms, spirit of Jezebel, etc., they get thrown around a lot. However, a lying spirit is a biblical term. When someone has, when someone's a compulsive liar, that's what we'd call it now, they have a lying spirit. That's the biblical term, a lying spirit. Verse 23, therefore look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. So he's saying, the Lord is preparing disaster for you, and he's allowed a lying spirit into the mouth of the prophets to set you up so that you'll fall. Now Zedekiah, the son of Taniah, said, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek, because he didn't tell him what he wanted to hear, and said, which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you. And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into the inner chamber to hide. In other words, he's saying, You'll see, because I prophesied in the name of the Lord, you'll see what's going to happen. So the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. In other words, because he's told the truth, he's now being locked up in prison. How many preachers of God are going to get locked up in prison for simply proclaiming the word of God? It's coming, brothers and sisters. Get ready for it. Until I come in peace. In other words, until I return from this war, Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. In other words, I know that you're going to get destroyed in this war. And if you return, it means the Lord hasn't spoken to me. And he said, take heed, all your people. So, After this, Ahab then disguises himself, very foolish idea, he disguises himself, Jehoshaphat goes into battle with him, and long story short, Ahab is killed in the battle with a bow and arrow. Verses 37 to 38, let's go to, verses 37 to 38. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. They buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed the chariot in a pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood whilst the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. So in other words, that prophecy back there, back in the previous chapter, which Elijah spoke, it came to pass exactly as it was spoken. Notice, though, the way that the Lord destroyed Ahab. He allowed him to go into a battle he knew he was going to die in, and he allowed, he didn't just actually allow, he sent a lying spirit into the mouths of the prophets, 
to deceive Ahab and to take him into a battle he was going to be destroyed in. That's what happens when you go that far. That's what happens when you are that wicked and you go beyond the point of no return. Even repentance will not get you out of it. It will only buy you time. However, the disaster here that God is talking about is not just the death of Ahab, but it's the cutting off of the entire Ahab dynasty, the entire house of Ahab. Then the end of chapter 22 is a brief summary of Jehoshaphat's reign. And then he was succeeded by his son, Jehoram, which we see in 2 Chronicles 17 to 20. And then Ahab's son, Ahaziah, takes over. But in 2 Kings chapter 1, Ahaziah is very quickly struck down by the Lord because he's worshipping Beelzebub, Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, a uh, Philistine god. And then his brother, Jehoram, succeeds him as king. So it's another son of Ahab here, his brother Jehoram, who is the next king. In 2 Kings chapter 2, this is when Elijah is taken up into heaven in the whirlwind. And Elisha now takes his place. Elisha is now going to succeed Elijah. And then Elisha goes on to perform a series of miracles, just like Elijah did. Again, a major type of Christ in the Bible. Let's go forward now to 2 Kings chapter 9, as we bring this to a, uh, an end soon. 2 Kings chapter 9, this is where we're reintroduced to Jehu. Jehu, a king who God had anointed to carry out this work of cutting off the dynasty of Ahab, of course. When God proclaims disaster, he normally raises up someone to carry it out. And that's why, back in 1 Kings, he asked Elijah to anoint Jehu as king. It was to carry out this disaster. So Jehu was made king. And in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 7 to 10, it says, You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets. All those prophets who were executed by the house of Ahab and Jezebel and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. The dogs shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. So that prophecy, once again, the destruction of Jezebel is now coming. We've had the destruction of the king, the political figure, but now the destruction of the wicked and moral woman is now coming as well. So Jehu carries out this execution of Jehoram, bow and arrow once again, straight through, and then Jehoram is thrown where? Into the, to the vineyard of Naboth, of all places. This is where the body of Jehoram was thrown to, the vineyard of Naboth. Now in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 to 37, let's go to, this is where we're going to see the destruction of the wicked woman, Jezebel, the destruction of the religious system, which it foreshadows. 2 Kings 9, verses 30 to 37. Now when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head, and looked through the window. Then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, you mur uh, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him and said, Throw her down. So basically Jehu was at the bottom there at the entrance, Jezebel was at the window, and he's calling out to two eunuchs who are inside the room with Jezebel. Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses and trampled her underfoot. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank, and he said, Go now, see this accursed woman, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But it did say in the prophecy that there'd be no one to bury her, didn't it? Verse 35. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet on the palms of her hand. Therefore they came back and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuge on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel, so that they shall not say, Here lies Jezebel. Aren't there some lovely, uplifting stories in the Bible, eh? <laughs> so in other words... That prophecy that Jezebel will be destroyed and there'll be nothing to bury came to pass exactly as Elijah, Elijah had spoken. So we've had Ahab destroyed, Jezebel destroyed. It's a picture of Babylon the Great, isn't it? It's a picture of the final Babylon, the final world's religious system which is coming and which is already in the pipeline, I believe. 
So you have political Babylon destroyed, religious Babylon destroyed. And this is all fulfilled in the book of Revelation, isn't it? It's fulfilled in Revelation chapter 18, the great whore of Babylon. Remember, all those wicked women in the Bible, Delilah, Jezebel, Herodias, Queen Athaliah, all those wicked women in the Bible all foreshadow this last one, who is the great whore of Babylon. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 8. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird. Unclean birds in the Bible were pictures of demons. The birds come along and snatch up the seeds, don't they, that are sown. Birds are pictures of demons in the Bible. A haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Idolatry and sexual immorality were connected in the Bible. They, were, they went hand in hand. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her. Remember, this is an image here of a woman who represents false religion. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. How many times have we heard that? If you're in an idolatrous, backslidden church, come out of her, my people. Do not remain in these churches who pray to the dead, who marry homosexuals, who, who ordain transvestites as priests. Come out of these churches, God is saying. Not because he wants them to be his people, but because they are his people. There are good, faithful people in these backslidden churches. And God is saying, Come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury. So give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. So in other words, just like Jezebel was destroyed according to exactly how she, should, she had done, it's exactly the same here in Revelation 18. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burnt up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. So there we have the beast and the false prophet who will be destroyed in Revelation 19. The beast and the false prophet, the political system and the religious system, they're all going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. Remember, what did Jesus say? The, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Not prepared for people, prepared for the devil and his angels. So now in 2 Kings chapter 10, this is when we're going to see all of Ahab's sons destroyed, the prophets and worshippers of Baal all killed, Anyone who was associated with the Ahab family, anyone who was associated was cut off. This is how much the Lord was cutting off this wicked family. Anyone associated. When you go too far, repentance will only buy you time. It will not buy you out. It's the same today. This nation has gone too far. This nation now, when we began murdering babies in their mother's wombs, when we began marrying sodomites, this is when this nation went too far. God should have wiped us out a long time ago. Why is he delaying? Because of the faithful remnant and because he's given people a chance to be saved. It says this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count kind of slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing that anyone should perish but that all should reach repentance. God is not willing that anyone should perish. He does not want to destroy anyone, but because of their wickedness, he's going, to he's going to destroy the wicked and their repentance is only going to buy them time because they have gone past the point of no return. In John chapter 12, they went from they would not believe to they could not believe. They could not believe. Not that they would not believe, but they could not believe. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 to 21 says it would have been better to have never known the truth in the first place than to have known the truth and then rejected it. If you know the truth and willingly reject the truth, boy, you're in trouble. That's what Peter's saying right there. So it wasn't just the Ahab dynasty that was destroyed. It was anyone associated with it. It was anyone who was connected to the house of Ahab. What's it going to be like in the last days? It's not just the political establishment that's going to be destroyed. It's not just the religious establishment that's going to be destroyed. It's anyone associated with it. It's anyone connected to the world's final system. 
The wrath of God is going to come against an evil, unrepentant world. But the Bible says that you and I are not appointed to God's wrath. Three times we see that. You and I are not appointed to God's wrath. So therefore, when God does pour out his wrath upon an evil, unrepentant world, you and I are going to be spared, not because we deserve to be, but because Jesus has saved us from a horrible, horrible destruction, just like the destruction of Ahab. He has saved us from that. We deserve it too. But because of his shed blood, because of his atonement and his forgiveness, we are now going to be spared from the wrath of God and transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the eternal truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that there is no error in your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Lord, we just praise you and thank you. You have given us this word to reveal who you really are. And Lord, we just take the good with the bad. We know, Heavenly Father, that this word is not acceptable to the world. But Lord, we just embrace every word that you have revealed to us. Because your word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for him himself who is the word, who gave himself for us on the cross and sacrificed his life to save us from that horrible disaster which is coming. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us have another time of worship. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus.